thank you so much and i hope i'm audible uh, so welcome to this panel and i'd like to thank the organizers and specifically uncdf for inviting all of us for this panel discussion now the topic of the panel discussion is south south collaboration for building inclusive digital economy and we are going to concentrate on three words being used here one is on collaboration second is on inclusiveness and third is digital right and with this i would like to thank all the esteemed panelists who have already been introduced and uh, i will straight away jump into the the discussions and i would request all of you to unmute yourself please my first question to jun when uh, now uh, you know the malaysian digital economy corporation is doing a lot of work to to ensure inclusive growth using digitization across sectors we would like to hear a little bit more about the fintech innovation efforts that is being done by MED, mdc the strategies and specifically on the partnership and collaborations involved in your journey please uh, thanks for that everyone um so and that we have been you know working on this uh, fintech journey for the past over past past five years uh We form several strategic partnerships in this. We um, consider the Islamic Development Bank, Visa, and Mastercard, and what we kind of do is that uh, we kind of offer various innovation programs in the areas of financial inclusion, uh, digitalization, to the startups in Malaysia. So, uh, with Yancy, yeah, we've, we've actually formed the Financial Innovation Lab, um, which was, was actually founded three years ago. Uh, this program is funded by the Mac Life Foundation, and it's done in collaboration with Yancy, yeah, the Central Bank of Malaysia, and MDEC. We have launched about five challenges um, during the past few years. Uh, their focus was mainly on inclusion, on how to actually empower the vulnerable people. to lead a more productive and health financially healthy life by expanding their access and usage of digital financial services thanks thanks jun and with that i'll move to ishita ishita now uh, you are one of the persons who's been involved with the uh, atal innovation mission from day one now atal innovation mission in india it aims at again promoting a culture of innovation across sectors we know what the issues are in india across you know whether it's education whether it's health whether it's agriculture whether it's financial inclusion nutrition etc so could you just tell us a little bit about how you are leveraging digital technologies for india's inclusive development uh, can you tell us about some of the stuff that we have achieved with some examples please Sure. So, uh, uh, like you rightly said, that Atal Innovation Mission has been set up by uh, at Niti Aayog to promote innovation and entrepreneurship in the country, with an objective of creating a facilitating environment for transformative innovations. And under the AIM umbrella, we have a cadre of programs across the innovation life cycle, right from the stage of ideation to the stage of uh, scaling up and deployment. So you know we have more than six thousand active thinking labs that have been set up. There are more than sixty incubators that have been set up. There are more than uh, close to twenty active community innovation centers. Then there are also programs that fund innovations, um, Dakin New India challenges and Dakin research and innovation cha- uh, innovation challenges for small enterprises. So, however, the underlying motivation across all the AIM programs. are not just to enable the entrepreneurs and the innovators but also to make the indian innovation ecosystem inclusive mature efficient and effective you know uh, india has been leading the digital india story since uh, so many years now made with the rupee card made with the jam trinity made with the upi or the direct uh, beneficiary transfer but the aim is no different in fact i would say that digital technologies uh, making use of frontier technologies like ai blockchain and inclusivity these are the three pillars or the foundations of aim let me give you a little bit of uh, you know uh, give you some illustrations so 
all of our programs the ones that i mentioned right now all of them are they are completely uh, managed and delivered virtually so you know right from receiving applications online applications uh, for for giving out grants whether it is their selection whether it's a transparent criteria for selection which is put online whether it is disbursement of funds or communicating with the stakeholders every time and and, and uh, uh, we have we have a very outcome and out, output based approach so for the first time the government our programs had monitoring dashboards that are able to track the performance of the beneficiaries uh, um, constantly we have close to uh, you know 3 to 4000 mentors of change that are working with our active thinking labs program and they are that are mentoring our startups most of them uh, 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 are doing this virtually we have a massive program for building the capacities of the incubators that we are supporting and the, uh, the aim micros program that is in partnership with the vadwani foundation and the pmgf bill and melinda gates foundation that is also being done online so we all our programs and initiatives are dev- are, are delivered online inclusion is underlined in all our programs so one of the programs that we have launched is about the agile community innovation centers it is for specifically for areas and regions of india which are underserved and unserved because you know sophisticated incubators cannot uh, cannot exist and survive in the rural areas therefore we have community innovation centers launched the tinkering labs program which is for school kids uh, grade 6 to 12 we have more than 6000 tinkering labs uh, across the country and 14000 uh, have been selected for uh, for the setting up 90% of the districts of india are covered under this program so we would have a tinkering lab one or more in 90% of the districts of uh, india covering all the 110 aspirational districts of india uh 70% of these schools would have uh the girl child attending the school so it would be a only girl school or it would be a co-ed school and you know uh, when it comes to incubators also we have incubators in places like tonk and raipur which are like a tier 2 tier 3 cities and if if the if the incubators focused only on women then it's given a priority and the third thing that i like to say is that frontier technologies is a focus of all our activities so if we take a thinking labs program there are modules uh, on AI the modules on advanced AI python design thinking ipr digital literacy creativity the, these are all made for kids of you know grade 6 onwards and all the 6000 tinkering labs reaching out to about 3 million students across the country rural urban government schools state boards national boards so on and so forth have access to all these study modules to just give you an idea of inclusion we received 7 lakh 63000 registrations for uh, the module on game development through the mobiles so that is the kind of reach that we have and we are doing this completely using uh, uh, you know completely using uh, digital technologies especially you know in, in the covid times the, the office was you know no one was coming to office and everyone was working from home and in spite of that none of our programs slowed down we in fact caught up more speed and we were able to work with all of our beneficiaries uh, and help them pass through these difficult times i know i've taken a lot of time but i'll just like to give one more example of uh, tech garage you know india's population and size unique uh, pose unique challenges for us and this gives us also the perfect opportunity to use technology data analytics and innovations at scale so recently we have uh, uh, niti aayog has launched the tech garage which will which is uh, you know which is based on the base very principle of public and private collaboration the idea is that there are some very crucial um apps or uh, uh, you know something like arogya setu on those lines there will be so many more applications that will be developed which are very very important for the citizens of the country they will be developed by the private sector companies uh, niti aayog will monitor the development and hand it out as a separate organization whenever they are ready to be scaled up so to give you one or two examples over there we have a app 
called Onati, which is a platform for upscaling the blue collar workers. Then there is Fresh Leaf, which is for agriculture platform for price forecasting, productivity, quality certification, so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, I would just like to say that we have a lot of collaborations in place, making use of which we are able to make all our programs inclusive, especially with the use of technology. Thanks, Ishita. Very comprehensive presentation. And in a country as large as India with a population of 1.4 billion people, extremely diverse and complex, that's wonderful to hear. Now from Asia, we move to Africa, uh, to Lisa. Lisa, uh, welcome firstly. And second is, uh, you are overseeing two large tax fintech initiatives in Africa. And you have over 20 years of experience with CGAP and you've seen, you know, financial inclusion and fintech developments across the world. Now, the question I have to you is regarding the two initiatives, that's AFA and ADF, what exactly are the objectives and what kind of partnerships and collaborations do we have across sectors? That's something we'll be very keen to know. Thank you, Lita. Thank you. It's great to be part of this of this discussion. Um, the the work that we lead here and based out of our hub office in Kenya um, is designed to work side by side with all kinds of actors trying to develop, test, and scale digital services for smallholder farmers. So you know, as one of the largest groups in the world uh, that is underserved by financial services and has so many challenges in reaching markets and facing challenges around climate change, um, the objective of the program is to harness technology, digital technology, um, to help reach as many farmers as possible with bundles of services. Uh, the goal of the program is to help farmers increase their income, productivity, and resilience by at least 50% and to reach at least 40% women as smallholder farmers. So as of now, we've been, we've been running the program here for about uh, five and a half years and we're now reaching uh, 16 and a half million farmers with uh, digital products and bundles of digital products uh, to help them grow. Um, there are five main areas of innovation that we support. So the first is financial inclusion. So all types of financial services on digital channels, so savings, loans, insurance, crop insurance, payments. The second is around digital platforms for markets. So for farmers to sell uh, their products in more improved marketplaces and, and to try to address so many of the inefficiencies around farmers and their access to markets, but also um, their access to important technologies like post-harvest loss. Um, the third major area is around smart farming and rural advisory. So how do we use digital channels to help farmers learn, uh, to help farmers understand technology, to help farmers understand how to adapt to uh, to um, um, the effects of climate change. Uh, the fourth is around digital logistics and using things like digital tractor ordering to help farmers become more productive. Sort of Uber for tractor types of models that are that are sprouting up. We're very lucky here in, in Africa that we've got a lot of great uh, young tech innovators, um, but but their biggest problem is scale. So they can develop great tech, but one of the things that the program tries to do is to work with an ecosystem of partners like commercial banks, mobile network operators, government, uh, agricultural businesses, and then tech innovators and, and, and farmer associations um, to try to tie together um, the strengths of all of the organizations, and I think much like the, the last presentation, to try to leverage um, leverage that huge footprint that's needed across Africa to bring digital technology uh, to farmers. So um, we're seeing now, on average, our impact studies are coming out and seeing that when you can get a bundle of digital services to a farmer that helps them learn, helps them get access to finances, improve markets, improve types of services like soil testing, we're seeing 79 to 150% increase in productivity and income. So it, it can work, but it definitely takes a lot of collaboration. Thanks, Lisa. Extremely impressive. 16 and a half million farmers. Huh? That's wonderful. And I'll get back to you about expansion within Africa, which is a very large con continent. And we all know the issues around food. Huh? To feed 10 billion people by 2050, the climate risk in the sector, and all of that. And with that, I'll now move over to Anjani. Anjani, uh, 
Well, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been mentioned by most of the speakers. Uh, you've been involved in multiple kind of initiatives across the world. Now, can you tell us a little bit that for your foundation, how important is collaboration across sectors, whether it's the public sector, the government, or other partners in the development sector? Anjali. Thanks, Arindam, and uh, great to be on the panel. Uh, and I'm really, uh, you know, great to hear the comments that were made by the speakers before me as well. Uh, you know, on behalf of the foundation, you know, what I can say is uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, we work in many countries across many areas of work. And uh, uh, you know, one thing which perhaps is equally relevant in all of that uh, is collaboration. And, um, uh, you know, collaboration amongst a very large number of different types of institutions, whether it's government, uh, private sector, academia, non-profit organizations, uh, and also community-based uh, organizations. And uh, that has been one of the, the core um, principles uh, on which uh, most of our work uh, uh, is, uh, is, has evolved over the last several years. You know, basically, I feel that, uh, you know, it's very context-specific on how to achieve that collaboration. And if we try to break down any problem into, you know, in, into parts, whether it is uh, what is the development, where is the development of a certain product or service happening, what is the channel of delivery, how would the adoption happen, and all those pieces rest on an ecosystem of regulations uh, and infrastructure. Uh, then we try to place these different actors into what is the role that they can play in that unique context. And uh, then the answer is very different based on the problem that we are trying to solve and which then points us to the direction of what is the role we can play as an organization. You know, to give you a couple of examples, uh, if you take, say, crop insurance. Now, we know, uh, let's say in case of India, uh, it, there are several bottlenecks uh, on, uh, effect, uh, on efficacy of crop insurance, starting with just the... Uh, the technology which is used to assess yields or uh, estimate payouts uh, and uh, a lot of regulatory issues uh, are around it. And uh, there, you know, uh, one hypothesis we have is perhaps uh, uh, technology is, uh, is the, uh, the way to lead uh, our intervention. So if we can, uh, uh, you know, promote entrepreneurs or innovators who are trying to solve uh, this uh, this puzzle using remote sensing or machine learning to bring greater accuracy and timeliness into insurance payouts, then perhaps uh, that solution can rally other ecosystem players uh, to uh, create a more effective solution. Uh, now that sort of a silver bullet uh, may not necessarily be available in every scenario. Uh, to take another example, uh, you know, one of the areas where we have recently started engaging is uh, building the MSME ecosystem in the country. Now, there isn't, there is just, uh, you know, the entire ecosystem, there are several places that need to work. Uh, and there our, uh, you know, we are supporting an organization called Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship, which is then playing the role of that anchor. that can pull together these different actors, whether it is large corporates, MSMEs, trade departments uh, to pull together uh, and build an ecosystem that can create a more conducive environment for MSMEs to grow. And uh, last I would say is that, you know, there is not always, you know, given the reality of the environment in which we all work, is that it's not always possible to have a well-defined strategy in place up front. We are all driven by constraints of resources, time, the window of opportunity that is there. So very often uh, we rely on our partners to essentially figure out how to collaborate and who are the right partners to engage uh, as things, uh, you know, gain some traction on the ground. And therefore working with right partners is critical for us. And a great example of that is on the panel today, uh, Ishita from Atal Innovation Mission. You know, partners like that are, are critical to our work in any country. Thank you. Thanks, Arjani. Uh, with that, I'll go back to Jun Wen. Now, Jun, now, uh, MDEC has a big financial, digital financial inclusion program called the e -Balker. Can you tell us a little bit about this program and what kind of financial inclusion goals are you seeking in Malaysia? Definitely. Um, 
So Ibu Kat is basically uh, a uh, digital, financial, digital financial inclusion program that has been designed from the ground up to provide access to the underserved. So for Malaysia, we have a population of, of about 36 million. It's a small population. We are about 96% bank as of uh, 2020. But then a large portion or large segment of our population are actually, you know, they don't have access to financial services and, like, you know, they're kind of un under insurance, right? So what we did was to, to actually build a marketplace that actually brings the fintechs together. So throughout our innovation journey with NCDF, we have created about, about 60 startups who look into various areas of financial inclusion that, you know, from credit scoring up until market insurance. So what we do that, we will just build a partnership with these fintechs, about 11 of them, um, focusing on three segments for now, to do insurance, savings, and investment. So we actually bring them on this platform you provide the necessary marketing for them to actually create impact at scale. Thank you. Thank you. So that's comprehensive financial services. It's not only that, but you are also providing other key financial services like insurance to the, you know, teeming millions in Malaysia. Wonderful to hear that. And with that, I'll move to Ishita. Ishita, kind of work you're doing and you're addressing the issues of 1.4 billion people in India. Now, you know, the learnings are huge and these learnings can also be used in other parts of the world because anything, I guess, which will work in India should work to a large extent in other parts of the world. Now, uh, how can, how do you learn from other initiatives which are going on in other parts of the world and how can the learnings within the other innovation mission which you are doing, how can that be used by other parts of the world for their development because so much has been invested and there's so much of learning. Thank you, uh, Arinda. So, well, you know, uh, we're all fairly young when it comes to uh, the scale and size of India and the time in proportion, and we take that in proportion to the time that we've been trying to implement the programs. Uh, our innovation mission is only four years old. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of learnings, but we are still learning. It's an ongoing journey. But to share some of my personal thoughts around the learnings that we have from uh, this program, I would think that one scale needs to be built in the design of the program itself. We can't plan for it at a later stage. So, you know, to give you a live example from our uh, from our experience, we have these uh, monitoring dashboards, online monitoring dashboards, which actually monitor the performance of our uh, uh, grantees. And they started crashing once more and more schools started using it. So we realized that we needed a much bigger uh, server and uh, architecture over there. And we should have planned for it uh, right earlier in the beginning. I mean, we could still manage it because we were a small program, but if you take it in terms of a country, uh, a lot of times you, these quick fixes may not work. India has been lucky in that manner. If I take the example of UPI, because UPI was already existing, we could rely on it at the time of demonetization and now in the times of COVID where we needed uh, digital payments to be used and which, is, which, are, which are contactless, contactless in nature. So that is one thing. The second thing I would say that a lot of these things, they have to be uh, replicable in nature. So when you are creating programs or when you're creating products and services that have to be used by the masses, they have to be able, you can, you should be able to quickly take them from one state to another state and from one place to another place, one school to another school. There cannot be a lot of customization when uh, so many people, so many different kind of regions, languages, geographies, topographies are involved. And the last thing that I would say is that the right ex management of expectations or the right communication is very important. So everyone should understand what is the objective of a program or the objective of the product being used. And they have to be in, in line with what is the requirement of the masses. I think those are my personal learnings from this. And one thing is... None of these things, I mean, I think the biggest 
learning is that none of these things would work if they were to be done only by our team. So all of uh, these things are working. We've we've been able to deliver uh, so much more than a regular government program is able to deliver in a period of four years time. And all this has happened because we have a lot of industry partnerships. We are partners with uh, the private sector, foundations, not for profits, other government programs, and all of us join hands in improving upon the quality and the quantity of the uh, programs that we have. I'll give you again uh, uh, one or two examples over there. So with the name, we have uh, we have come across a lot of interest in traction in adopting the entire uh, uh, adult tinkering labs program across other countries, maybe countries like Russia or Australia. Similarly, uh, that was about one of our own programs. And another example is when one of our incubators, AIC Selco Foundation, which is based in Guwahati. They are actually replicating programs in other countries. So they uh, they are focused on energy and energy systems, and they've created an entire sort of a system where they have a uh, they train people on how to use those energy efficient machines and how to innovate around it. And then there is uh, how to uh, uh, you know how to go out and sell products like that. And that entire program, the entire ecosystem, is now being transferred to countries like Ethiopia and Tanzania with the help of, of course, with the help of the local partners there. But there's no reason that you know what happens here in India cannot be done in other places of the world. So, I, I would think that uh, you know, uh, collaboration is key, and the collaboration can happen not only within a country but between multiple countries together and the models that can work here in india can work in various other places so uh, on this forum through through this panel discussion i would like to take this opportunity opportunity to invite um, all the organizations that would want, want to join hands with us and come and contribute towards the causes of innovation and entrepreneurship we will be happy to facilitate thank you uh, arindam for inviting me and it was a pleasure speaking and sishita you made a wonderful point that to achieve the first 16 sdgs sdg 17 is critical that is about collaboration nobody can do it alone wonderful sishita and these are now over to you i would like to ask a question now had i asked this question 15 years earlier to you probably you would have given me a different answer but today with the scope of digital technology which was not there 10 to 15 years earlier which is all that there and happening now If you need to scale up your operations and ensure, you know, uh, fintech, uh, inclusive fintech for the farmer community in Africa, and if you have to scale up from 16.5 million to say 100 million farmers across Africa, what would it take? What kind of partnership and collaborations would that take? Mm-hmm. Um, Thank you. Um, it, it, it's it's an exciting question because that's exactly what we have to do to to be relevant in the face of big problems like, uh, like you said, you know the you know increasing population here in Africa, increasing demand for food at a time when it's going to become more difficult to grow food. Um, I would say that you know. One thing that we've learned is is to start everything from a point of, of farmer centricity, of human centered design. Um, I completely agree with Ishita that these models can work across all kinds of countries, um, but you you still have to contextualize them and understand what works for women in Zambia, what works for uh, you know rice farmers in Nigeria. Um, so we we de- we we do depend a lot on human centered design as the as the starting point for all of our of our design projects. And one thing that we've learned um, about scale is that multi-channel approaches in a digital world are extremely important. So you know, I, I, was, I was reading somewhere that that a lot of people have to receive information from three different channels before they truly believe it and change behavior. So you know, we are working. Across uh, chatbots and Android apps and radio and television and Facebook groups and WhatsApp groups and you know SMS, uh, IVR, um, basically using every type of channel that you have, um, you know, to get to different kinds of groups. And what we realize is that. Um, a lot of channels are out there, and it's it's fairly easy in digital environment to adapt content to different to different channels. So that's something that we've learned. Um, but we've also learned in in um, in the ag space here in Africa that 
uh, you know, to really have breakthrough uh, impact and scale, you still need boots on the ground. So I think our first couple of years was a lot of, um, you know, just building it on a phone. Uh, and, and then we realized that when you start getting into complex products and services, there's still really a role uh, for the human for the human interface, for the person there who's talking uh, to the farmer, who's translating more about technology, building trust, uh, building capacity. So I think that the marriage of, uh, of human and technology is going to be extremely important in agriculture as we scale. And that's important for job creation. You know, we're excited that, that technology is creating new jobs in Africa. Um, and, and then I think, you know, for real scale, you have to have an ecosystem approach. Um, the problems in agriculture can't be solved by one single actor on their own. Um, and so it really does require, uh, it, it does require the ability to speak multiple languages. And I mean, the language of fintech, the language of agriculture, the language of data sharing, the language of, uh, of, of financial institutions, you need to be able to speak all of those languages. Um, and uh, and you, you need to have the partnership models and the business models and the data sharing models for all of those different actors to be able to interact on digital superhighways. So yeah, it's, I, I, think, I think we are going to be looking at, at 100 million farmers soon, and, and it's going to be an exciting journey. Thanks, Lisa. Wonderful observations. You make two very interesting points. One is you're saying that agriculture, like other sectors, is both a science and an art, and technology has to be rooted in the local culture to really be efficient. And second, you made the point about physical, that, you know, in the initial foray into technology, you need not only technology, it's not a silver bullet, but you require a good physical presence and understanding of the local situation to be able to adapt to technology so that it becomes more meaningful. Thanks so much, Lisa. So with that, I move to Anjali. Anjali, now, uh, PS, PM, GF, huh? You do these massive programs across sectors, across regions, across continents, across countries. Now, how easy is it to share, you know, the experience that you have in one program which is successful in a certain part of the world, replicated in another part of the world, and how easy is to set the, you know, the collaboration and partnership pieces in different parts of the world. Because if something is successful in one part of the world, you require a similar ecosystem approach in another part of the world. So how does PFGF deal with this? Yeah, uh, so Arindam, you know, it's, uh, well, the speakers before me covered some of it around, uh, you know, the importance of, uh, uh, you know, adapting to local environment. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, it's not something that we have deep expertise in, this cross-border replication. I think it's a, it's a new area for us, uh, particularly, uh, uh, you know, uh, in India, you know, we have increasingly realized with the maturity and pace with which innovations are coming up, there is a, there is a great opportunity in front of us to port some of those ideas to other countries uh, where we work. Uh, now, in addition to... Uh, you know, uh, the points that uh, Ishita and uh, Lisa made, I would add, you know, the importance of being demand-led. You know, uh, because something has worked for us in one country, it does not necessarily mean that uh, the, the, the government or private sector in other countries uh, have prioritized it uh, as their main, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, activity. And therefore, working with those, uh, you know, uh, uh, with people on the ground to figure out what is most important for them uh, is uh, the first necessary step. And we're seeing that there is a lot of demand in certain areas, whether it is diagnostics of uh, uh, TB or uh, agriculture technology or uh, the India stack for digital financial services. You know, there is a lot of demand uh, which is driving uh, our in work in uh, replicating these, uh, these uh, uh, you know, areas of uh, growth in India and other countries. Um, and, and the last point, you know, I would say is that um, uh, there is also, uh, you know, uh, we should not underestimate the need for uh, adapting to local needs. You know, while uh, the, the core product or core technology may be solving a very similar problem, uh, in other countries, but just the, uh, you know, that's perhaps 15%. You know, the remaining uh, 80, 85% is uh, around building those local champions, adapting it to local, uh, you know, socioeconomic environment. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the innovators who are developing it in India 
most of the time are not very, uh, uh, you know, comfortable with operating in other countries uh, and therefore building their capability to operate in new environments takes time. So it requires a lot of patience to, uh, to see uh, fruits uh, of this cross-border replication. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ajit. Now, uh, a quick response, a 30 seconds response from each of you. Uh, so we just have five minutes left. And first to Jun Wen. Now, all your efforts are centered around, you know, digital technologies because that is that seems to be the biggest enabler. Now, how 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 does the government uh, uh, imbibe technology in the work that it does? Because at the end of the day, development is the mandate of the government. How deeply embedded is technology in the government's way of work? Well, uh, for the Malaysian government, we use uh, you know technology on a daily basis. Um, the tools and the processes are digital. Uh, for example, we even do uh, digital subsidy disbursement using e-wallets. Another good example would be how many of the our government government services are actually online. You know, so you can you know apply for license online. You can pay your your duties online, so on and so forth. Thank you. Very, very useful. And Ishita, now, uh, you know, at the uh, Innovation Mission, the great work that you are doing, now, uh, when it comes to the private sector and the, specifically the state governments, huh, how do you include the different state governments into your mission, into your programs? Well, so to begin with, we had started doing this um, ourselves as a part of Niti Aayog initiatives. But then uh, over the period of time, we have been uh, connecting with the state governments and we have been writing letters to the uh, chief education officers within every state to make sure that they, they become responsible, for example, for the tinkering labs in their states. And uh, we have been doing outreach. We have been speaking to all the stakeholders on a state basis. There are state innovation councils in India. We, we, we are connected with some of them. And they, in turn, uh, you know, sort of take care of some of the innovation and entrepreneurship-related activities in that particular state. So we are trying to bring all the stakeholders together over a period of time as we uh, move along and as we scale up. Thank you. Thanks. And Lisa, 30 seconds answer, please. Now, uh, you know, without technology and collaboration, do you think that financial inclusion and agriculture development is even possible in a large continent like Africa? That's a really good question because we're wrestling with it now. And with the impacts of COVID, of course, the banks have become even more conservative uh, in lending in any sector, but particularly in agriculture, um, as movement is restricted, access to labor is restricted. So we definitely have a, a real challenge around financial inclusion uh, and smallholder farmers here in Africa. Um, what I hear from commercial banks is that the only way that they can make it work to lend to smallholder farmers any longer is to get a digital data trail on them. Um, to understand where they are, what they're doing, what their history is, um, you know, if they've had, you know, it, you know, it, what they're growing. Um, so, so I think without digital data, you're not going to see large-scale financial inclusion for smallholder farmers across Africa. It's absolutely critical now. Thank you, Lisa. Anjali, 30 seconds. How important is digitization for inclusive development? Oh, uh, I mean, it does probably, uh, you know, the. Uh, you know the uh, uh, the sil if there is one silver bullet. It is perhaps that. You know, uh, I think. Uh, you know, however, I would say that there is still a lot of work to be done uh, between uh, making it a priority and making it a reality. Uh, you know, I think there is a lot of variance in different countries where we are working in uh, bridging that gap. But uh, I'm pretty optimistic that we are heading in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. So. We have touched upon collaboration, we have touched upon, you know, digitization and inclusiveness, and I think that a lot of work is going on, but without collaboration and digitization, inclusive development is not going to happen. Thanks a lot to all the panelists. With that, I would like to hand over the session.